The text is Psalm 50, verse 15. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. For a long time, this message has been pointing forward to a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And the troubles have been increasing as we near the climax. As the prophet to the remnant wrote shortly before her death, soon grievous troubles will arise among the nations, troubles that will not cease till Jesus comes. That soon is already here. And what is it that God is listening to hear from his people? A call. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. And the way God gets us ready for the larger troubles is to test us with smaller trouble. Just as we start children with small problems in mathematics and lead them on to larger ones. But you know, a little problem for a little child may be as big for him as the big problem is for the man, isn't it? So the problem that you face today is your size. I mean your size provided you do what this text says. Unless we learn how to handle problems, all of them are too big for us. But call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. In Desire of Ages, page 667, we are told, in every difficulty we are to see a call to prayer. Here comes a difficulty down the road to meet me. What am I to see? Not merely a difficulty, a what? A call to prayer. If it were a grizzly bear coming down the path, I imagine I'd recognize it as a call to prayer, wouldn't you? There are problems worse than bears. But in every difficulty, we're to see a call to prayer. You know, I like a statement like this because it eliminates any necessity on my part for analyzing this particular difficulty to see whether this statement belongs to it. Because in how many difficulties? In every difficulty, I'm to see what? A call to prayer. So I don't have to look it over first and see, well, now, is this something I've got to call to God about? No. In every difficulty, I'm to see a call to prayer. Ministry of Healing, page 509. Prayer and faith will do what no power on earth can accomplish. Will you repeat that with me? Prayer and faith will do what no power on earth can accomplish. Wouldn't you like to go over that again? Prayer and faith will do what no power on earth can accomplish. What will do it? Prayer and faith. What will prayer and faith do? What no power on earth can accomplish? Greater than the United Nations? Oh, yes. Much greater. More, more power than all the money of Wall Street. More wisdom than the great men of earth had. What can get these blessings for us? Prayer and faith. Prayer and faith will do what no power on earth can accomplish. 
oh friend, as we go into this time of trouble, I long that we shall learn that Jesus is with us and that he wants us to have an active, personal faith in his presence and in his ability to help us no matter what the situation is. A few nights ago, I heard Dr. Hansen telling a little group in a home a most interesting experience that he heard over in Africa just a few weeks ago. Doctor, will you come and share with us? A few months ago, we were in Zambia, right in the heart of Central Africa. And on a Sabbath afternoon for our Sabbath evening Vespers, we heard a story related by a man by the name of Brother Salim, a black man, a Zambian, a born in Africa, raised there, and yet well-educated, speaking not only English, but Swahili, French, and several of the Zambian local languages. A very intelligent man and a God-fearing man. Brother Salim told us that just about two and a half, three years ago, when the Congo rebellion took place and the rebel forces were fighting and the UN troops were called in, that he was selected to be the personal translator for the head of all the UN forces. And as translator, he naturally had access to all of the intelligence information that was coming through, to the movement of troops, to the location of supply lines, to all of the important information, for he was the translator to the, the head of all the UN forces there that were fighting for freedom in the Congo. But during the fighting, the battle went back and forth and between cities and villages. He was captured by the enemy forces and along with many others thrown into prison in a stockade there. And when he was captured, because they knew who he was as a key man and he wouldn't talk, he was sentenced to be shot. For three weeks as he was there in prison, they gave him no food, just water. Starved him for three weeks. And then the day came when he was to be shot. And they took him out before the firing squad, and he was so weak from lack of food that he just collapsed. And they began talking among themselves, and they said, we can't shoot this man. He can't even stand up. Take him back and feed him. And so they put him in the truck and started to take him back to the stockade where the other prisoners were kept. And on the way back, one of them pulled open his sack and he said, do you want some food? The food had flesh in it and Brother Salim's a vegetarian and has been for several years. And here he had been starving for three weeks, but he said, no, thank you. I can't eat this food. The Lord's forbidden me to eat this. And I believe that he'll either provide for me or he'll give me strength. Appreciate it, but no thank you. And these soldiers, hardened, rebellious, were so impressed by this that they took him back. And for three more weeks, they gave him vegetables. And his strength revived. And then came the next day that they'd appointed when he was to be shot. In fact, the leader of the rebel forces there in the Congo had said, I want to personally witness this execution, so don't shoot him unless I'm there. And so they began to take him out of the prison, put him in a truck, and the driver and the guard went along with him down to the appointed place. And along the way as they were driving, the guard and the driver got to arguing where they were supposed to go and they couldn't agree. Now just before he left that morning, during the night, he'd been strongly impressed that the Lord was going to deliver him. And he told some of the other prisoners who were right there in the same cell where he was that I'll see you back this evening. 
the Lord showed me. And so along the way, as they were traveling, they were arguing where they should go, and they couldn't agree, so they turned around and went back to get directions from the head of these soldiers just where they should go. And while they were turning around, going back for directions, and then starting off again, the delay had caused the head of these rebel forces to get tired of waiting, so that he left. And so when they arrived, he wasn't there, and they'd had strict orders that he wasn't to be shot unless the man was there, and so they couldn't execute him, and they took him back to the prison. Well, as he arrived back there, Brother Salim walked in. You can imagine the effect on the other prisoners, for there had been many men that had been taken out and been executed. It was happening right along, and here he walks back in. And they were so impressed that they began to ask him about his faith. And for some reason, someone had a Bible there, and they found a Bible, and for hours he studied with them the Word of God, the promises, the assurance in Jesus' second coming, and the precious truths, and he studied with those prisoners there, right in the stockade. But the story wasn't over yet, for he still was under sentence to be shot. And one morning the soldiers came in, they were going to take it right into their own hands, and one of them pointed his rifle right at Brother Selim, said, I'm going to get you, and he pulled the trigger. But the gun didn't go off. And he pulled it again, and he checked, and the gun would not fire. And then he turned to another prisoner, and he fired, and the gun went right off and killed him right on the spot. Well, Brother Selim, as he tells the story, has not only one deliverance, two deliverances, but a whole series of providences that took place day by day until he was finally, after being starved, as I mentioned, suffering for want of food, beaten several times, he was finally released and turned loose and stumbled barefooted along the way his feet began getting sore as he walked through the jungle trying to avoid the roads. And finally he just knelt down. He said, Lord, I, I need shoes. He walked along through the bushes, and lo and behold, within a few paces he found a shoe. He put it on. But it was so awkward walking with one shoe on and one shoe off that he took it off and threw it away. And then as he walked on, his conscience bothered him. He said, Lord, I prayed for a shoe, and you gave me one. I'm going to go back and put that on. And he found it in the bushes. And as he walked along a little farther, he found its mate. And now he had two. And then it wasn't too far along, but he met some other soldiers of the same rebel forces. And as he was talking with them, they argued about who this fellow might be. And they, they didn't believe it could be him because the man that had been released didn't have any shoes on, and this fellow had shoes. And uh, as the story goes along, he finally got back to the UN forces and was identified and restored. And as the war was over, he was returned to his family. Today, Brother Salim is up in the northern part of Zambia, taking a little farm and turning it into a missionary training center to prepare young Zambians to preach the gospel. And his story of faith is an inspiration not only to them, but to me. And I know God is still a God that hears and answers prayer. For I've seen a man that's been delivered from the mouth of the lion. Let's read our text again, shall we? All together. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. That's what Brother Salim has done, isn't it? He cried. Did he get delivered? And he's been glorifying God. I was thinking of this experience that Peter had at Luke, 
the beloved physician wrote down in the book of Acts. You remember that Herod decided to kill him. He killed James. That pleased the Jews. Does God sometimes allow his servants to be executed? Sure. The blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. But when Peter was thrown in prison, the whole church, you remember, did what? Pray. Doubtless they read this very promise from the Psalms that we read tonight and claimed the promise. And so night and day they prayed earnest. What did God do? Sent his angel, opened up the prison door, brought Peter out. What a wonderful deliverer Jesus is. You and I are headed for one experience after the other of test, trial, but he's testing us today with problems. I was going to say our size. As I said, there are our size provided we do what this text says. I want to ask you a question, not to answer me, but to answer yourself. How much time are you spending Taking your problem to the Lord in prayer and believing he will answer you and solve those problems. Has prayer become a way of life to you, a way of problem solving? Our tendency is to think that these problems interrupt our Christian experience that they delay our spiritual maturity, that they get in the road of our soul winning. But in God's wonderful providence, everything he allows to get in our way can be a stepping stone rather than a stumbling stone. Of course, it's up to us which we make of it. If we allow the enemy to stop us through these difficulties, then God is sorry. He's disappointed because his purpose in allowing the difficulty doesn't come to pass. He wants us to learn to do what when we get in trouble? Call upon him. Call upon him. It doesn't make any difference what the difficulty is, dear friend. Whatever it is. You know, when we came here 35 years ago this month, there wasn't very much here except what was yet to be seen. We started with just a little. But among other things that we had to face, was some obligations that we had assumed on the property. We signed our names to some notes to pay off these obligations. I have a note here that I like to look at. The last note payment on the property. And it's marked pay. Four days before that last $500 payment was due, we didn't know where one dollar of it was coming from. We didn't have it. And we didn't know anybody that did that would let us have it. You know what we did? We did what the text said. Now, we were working, of course. We were plowing and spading and working in the garden and the farm and looking toward getting some building done when we could. But we had to get these notes paid first. And friends, through four different people, the money for that last $500 was supplied, and as I say, we didn't have any of it four days before. God has kept his promise again and again. 
Every building on this campus has been made possible by miracle. No two alike. No two, two situations ever the same. But through them all run the golden thread of God's providence. The glorious fact of God answering prayer. Call unto me, Jesus said, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you don't know. Jeremiah 33, 3. This chapel that we sit in tonight, the whole series of miracles, how God brought together the money and the men and the materials that made this building possible. The sanitarium over on the hill. When we started that a few years ago, the new hospital, all we had money enough for was to pour the footings. How about taking what little money you have and putting it in footings? If you don't get any more, what good are the footings? I'm glad that God kept pouring in the money and the materials and the men. More than once, as that work progressed, the family here on this campus had to gather together in this chapel and seek the Lord as to where the next was coming from. But the workmen never stopped, my friend. They never stopped. God always had some way to go ahead. Prayer brought the answer. Tonight, I, I have longed that God shall inspire in every heart the confidence that he will help you solve your personal problem. For everybody has them. If there's a soul here tonight that doesn't have one right now, you can think of one you had once upon a time, can't you? And you just as well take what we're studying tonight and salt it down or put it in the deep freeze because you're going to need it. You're going to run into a problem tomorrow or next week. It may be a health problem. It may be a financial problem. It might be persecution. It might be misunderstanding. Might be a difficulty in the home, or difficulty with some neighbor, or difficulty with some brother or sister in the church. Jesus said, It's too bad that offenses come, but he said they have to come. That is, people have to be tested and tried. And in every difficulty, we're to see what? A call to prayer. Not a call to fault finding, not a call to complaining. Not a call to analyzing people and finding out what's the matter with them. What in the world is the matter with them? Why do they make so much trouble for me? Why, indeed. In every difficulty, we're to see what? A call to prayer. A call to prayer. And thank God, he's in the prayer hearing and the prayer answering basis, a prayer answering business. Some practical suggestions. When you pray about your personal problems, do you know the place to pray for them? I'll go to Matthew 6 and we'll find out. The sixth verse, Matthew 6, 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. What's the closet? Well, it's a, a, a room where you can be by yourself. Thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door. What do you shut the door for? For privacy. Shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Secret prayer. Praying alone. I was noticing some interesting comments on this. 
Volume 1, page 145 and 146. When the subjects of our prayer are at a distance, the closet is the proper place to plead with God for them. Till I come to this congregation and say, I wish you'd pray for my uncle. He's going to be operated on next week in Houston, Chicago. No. Till I come to you and say, I wish you'd pray for my brother, my aunt. I'm sending them these Times magazines, and I wish you'd pray for them, that God will help them to accept the message. When the subjects of our prayers are at a distance, the closet is the proper place to plead with God for them. What about the members of our family? Same page. We should not come to the house of God to pray for our families unless deep feeling shall lead us while the Spirit of God is convicting them. Generally, the proper place to pray for our families is at the family altar. Now, you notice three kinds of prayer here. Prayer all alone with God in the closet. Family prayer at the family altar. And then public prayer in the congregation. And there are proper subjects for each of these. A similar statement in volume two of the Testimonies, page 578. In private prayer, all have the pr privilege of praying as long as they desire and of being as explicit as they please. They can pray for all their relatives and friends. Where? Private prayer. The closet is the place to tell all their private difficulties and trials and temptations. A common meeting to worship God is not the place to open the privacies of the heart. When we have a testimony meeting, that isn't the time to tell all your personal and private problems and sin and mistakes and failures. No. Where is the place to do that? Where? What do we read? The closet. Open up the heart to God. In fact, that's the purpose of being alone with God. Aren't there a lot of problems you have that you'd rather not tell other people about? I hope you have some inhibition in those matters. And notice the promise that if we will persevere with God in secret prayer, the results will be seen openly. The victories that God gives us the deliverances that he works out. The solution of problem will bring a light to our countenance, a joy in our experience that will cause others to rejoice with us in God's wonderful plan of salvation. You see, dear friend, prayer is not a matter of... Uh, influencing one another. Prayer is a matter of laying hold of the mighty arm of God and of getting God to move in our behalf. And the reason God has a strategy in all this, the reason that God calls us to come into a secret place, is not simply that some of the things we want to talk with him about are of a private nature. But some of the things he wants to talk to us about are of a private nature. Many a time God has talked to me about things when I was kneeling down and asking him for help, either for myself or for others. Things that other people didn't talk to me about. Maybe things that other people didn't know. Duties he wanted me to do. Weaknesses he wanted to correct sins he wanted to take out of my life, errands he wanted me to go for him. Oh, yeah, these secret prayer occasions are precious fellowship opportunities between the soul and God. Aren't they, dear friend? And this is the fount of blessing. 
public prayer, family prayer have their place, but it is secret communion with God that sustains the soul's life. Without this, we're dry and withered, like a plant without water. Now, many people who can pray in public even, or at the family altar, when they get alone with God, it seems difficult for them to pray. Let me give you a few practical suggestions in that. One is pray aloud. Well, you say, what's the use of praying aloud? There's nobody to hear. Yes, God is waiting to hear. But God can hear me, can't he, whether I open my lips or not? Sure he can. He can read your mind. Then why pray? Why pray at all? Why, the reason to pray is because he's told us to. We just read it in our text, didn't we? Let's repeat it again. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Ah, oh, my friend, when Jesus was in Gethsemane, do you suppose he merely thought prayer when he was talking to his father? Oh, no. He cried. He cried to God. And Jesus is waiting to hear us talk to him. The truth of the matter is, opening our lips and framing words helps us to keep our mind on what we're praying about. Now, to pray aloud does not mean to pray loud. If there's somebody so close by that you even have to whisper, in order to be in secret, you can do that. My point is, open your lips and speak to God in secret prayer. Another thing that is helpful in secret prayer is taking your Bible and letting God speak to you through its pages as you speak to him in prayer. Instead of just kneeling down and thinking about, well, now what shall I pray about? You may have something on your heart. You may pray about that. But if you will take the word of God and let God begin to speak to you through these pages, then you'll have something to talk to him about. Respond. Talk to him about what he's talked to you about. Another reason for having the word of God when you pray is the same reason that you take a check to the bank when you want money. Suppose we visit the bank someday. We see one person after another going up there to the teller's window and coming away with money. And suppose somebody should say, well, that looks easy. I wonder if they'd give me some. And so suppose that person goes up and says, will you give me some money? I noticed some of these people... I saw a man just take a hundred dollars away and one took fifty. Would you give me ten? Will they give him ten? Not unless he has what? A check. Sure, a man can get a hundred dollars if he has a check properly drawn and endorsed, but he can't even get ten without the check. The promises of God are checks. And if you and I will bring to God his own promises and endorse them, say, Lord, I know this is meant for me, and I'm submitting your promise. Oh, friends, there is no limit to what God is waiting to do. I want you to turn over to those closing words that Jesus had with his disciples there in the upper room. Wonderful words of promise here in John, 16th chapter, 24th verse. Speaking to the eleven there, he said, Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. They were to ask, in whose name? Jesus' name. We have nothing to recommend us to God. 
we have no reason to expect that he will look upon us with favor in our sins and weaknesses. But if we come in Jesus' name, that is, if we accept him as our Savior and substitute, praise God, pray. His name has power in the courts above. His name is recognized. And I can bring his name if I accept his nature, his character. And all that Jesus deserves can be mine. Oh, I want that, don't you? And thank God I can have it. And in every difficulty, I'm to see what? A call to prayer. When somebody says, Brother Frizee, I have prayed, but nothing seems to happen. What shall I do? Keep on praying. Keep on praying. You remember in Luke, the 11th chapter, Jesus told the story about the man who at midnight had a friend come to see him, and there was no food in the house. The man apparently had been traveling all day and into the night and needed something to eat. What did this man do? Why, he went to a neighbor. Who's there? Oh, your friend. Your neighbor. What in the world do you want this time of night? Why, I've got a friend that's come. He's hungry and I don't have anything. Will you get up and give me three loaves of bread? Lend it to me. Oh, I'm sleepy and the children are here with me in bed. Better not bother me tonight. What'd the man do? Kept on. He kept on until the man got up and got him the bread. You remember, don't you? It's all there in Luke 11. And Jesus told the story not to teach us that God doesn't like to be bothered, nothing of the kind. But, get the lesson, if a selfish man will finally give in and get the bread, and give it to the man that keeps on asking how much more God will hear the persistent prayers of those who continue in supplication. That's what he's telling. So ask, and it shall be given you. Jesus has got answers for your prayer. Jesus has answers for your prayer. Is it true, friend? Is Jesus really up there at the mercy seat tonight? Is he holding up his wounded hands for us? Is the light from Calvary reflected from those golden walls? Is the heart that was broken for us there at Golgotha thinking of us tonight? Oh, as the servant of God says, what a wonder it is that we pray so little. But I'll tell you honestly, our human hearts work this way. If we can find any other way to solve a problem, we'll do it. Prayer is usually the last resort. Yeah, isn't it? That's why God sometimes has to just shut every door till he can get us to enter the door that leads into the closet, alone with him. Anybody here tonight decided that you're going to take some problem to Jesus in prayer? May I see your hand? Thank God. He can give each one of us as much attention as though that one were the only one. Don't ask me how he does it. I know he does. Yes. He's looking after me as if all he had to do was just to see that my prayers are answered, my calls are responded to. He's a wonderful friend, a wonderful friend. All right, we're going to have a little time of witnessing now. We'll ask that our testimonies be short. There are two kinds of testimonies that I'm asking for, especially tonight. The first, there's somebody here can say, yes, I know Jesus answers prayer because he's answered mine. 
Now, we won't have time tonight for you to tell us a long experience, but if you can just add your word that God is true, that'll bless some soul, make Jesus happy. But there's another kind of testimony I'm listening for tonight. Somebody's going to say, I've got some problems, and I see tonight that Jesus has the answer. And I'm going to seek him with all my heart, and I know he's going to hear. All right, come, dear one, you who want to speak. I'm thankful that uh, God's plan is to close every door so that we'll have to come to him in prayer. And I'm thankful he does things that way because I get awfully lonely for him between problems. It's lonely for you too, brother. I want to tell a wonderful answer to prayer that involves you, and you don't know about it yet. Well, I'll listen then. <laughs> uh, you know, we're running such a, our Wildwood Corporation is running such a big operation all over the world, and we don't have the money to run it. So the Lord finances it, but our, our group up in New Hampshire that are struggling, getting started this first cold winter. Brother Atwood called me yesterday morning, and uh, we are, uh, they're trying to get out this set of English books. It's going to cost $35,000 to get the, get the first 10000 of each one printed. And uh, we just didn't know how we were going to finance this thing. And uh, we were, and so Brother Atwood called me yesterday morning and said, in talking to some wealthy Seventh-day Adventist printers in the East, uh, they explained this dilemma to them, and one of the men said, well, I'll loan you that $35,000 for six months, and maybe I'll be able to loan it on and on, but I can loan it for a while. Praise and the Lord. that's an answer to my prayer and your prayer and Brother Atwood's prayers and a lot of other people. Thank you, brother. That's right up to date. I thank the Lord that he answers prayers. The story Dr. Hansen related tonight had a very familiar ring to when I was growing up as a teenager in Columbia. But I'm not going to tell you about any of those numerous, numerous prayers that we experienced answered there at that time. God answers prayers right here in Wildwood. And I would like to just tell in a few sentences something that happened just within the last two weeks in behalf of someone else in the village. Our health department has been going over to Hooker to do missionary work. And uh, we went out two weeks ago tomorrow to give out the... Ministry of Healing to the very homes to which we gave bread not too long ago. And when I had visited this one particular home, the first time, the lady did not let me into the door because she said her husband had been sick and her house was not in order enough for me to go in to visit. But we had a wonderful visit on the front porch. And last couple of Sabbaths when Lucy and I went back, she invited us in and we went in. Her husband was not yet well. He was seated in his living room and his leg was perched up. I had a chance to look at his leg and between every toe was matter coming out of his skin. It was very inflamed and he had a very bad case of cellulitis. And so we talked a little about that and he was giving it the right treatment the doctor had prescribed. Except for one thing, as we, I noticed that as we talked and conversed and the conversation was very free and easy, but I noticed he was smoking one cigarette right after the other. And uh, that very day was the day before our five-day stop smoking plan was to start. So we had carried along a few of the invitations to invite people to this stop smoking plan. However, I saw that the way he was smoking, it would not be an easy thing to approach him about it. So we continued on other subjects. About the time we were to leave, I said to him, um, I presume you know you need to have good circulation for that foot to get well. And he was well aware of that. He says, yes, his doctor had told him about that. I asked him if he knew that the cigarettes were closing up his arteries and that he was not getting the oxygen he needed to the toes. And he said, oh, yes, my doctor has asked me to stop, but stop smoking, but I don't want to not stop. He says, I like to smoke and I want to continue smoking. And so he talked like that for quite a while. And um, I just listened to him and I said to him, well, we are having a program starting tomorrow for people who would like to stop smoking, but if you do not have the desire to stop, we probably won't be able to help you. And so he continued to affirm me that he really did not want to stop.
stop. And then he looked at me after a while and he says, but you really want me to stop, don't you? <laughs> and I said, yes, I really do. And your wife really feels bad that you're sick, but I believe God really feels worse than either your wife or I do. And he says, well, if a person doesn't really want to stop, how can he stop? How can he want to stop? That's a good question. And the Lord was good to me in giving me this little answer that I said to him. Well, I can't give you that desire, but God can give you. Uh, and if you ask him, he will give it to you. And he looked so longingly up in my face. I said, well, this must be the time to ask him if we could pray for him. And we volunteered to pray for him. And he said, yes, he would like for us to pray for him. So Lucy and I knelt there in the living room and prayed for him. And so I left the card with him telling him to call us if he decided he'd like to do it, go to the plan the next day because... He could not drive. His wife didn't know how to drive, and he could not drive, so we would have to provide transportation. All day Sunday, I prayed for that man, and he didn't call. And it was 10 o'clock, and he hadn't called. My husband was about to come home from the stop smoking plant, and I couldn't get my mind off of him, so I tried to. I decided I was going to call, and I decided it wasn't wise. It was too late. But the next day, I called in the evening, and I asked his wife, how is your husband doing? How is he feeling? And I thought perhaps he could start the stop smoking plan late, even though he didn't. He missed one day. And she said to me, my husband is doing just fine. He hasn't smoked one cigarette since you prayed for him. Oh, and uh, I called her. The last time I called her was Wednesday. It's now two weeks and he hasn't smoked yet. And I thank the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful that the Lord answers our prayers, prayers of the past. I'm thankful. Lord answered my prayers for today. And what a blessing to know that all perplexities are gone. And I'm thankful that the Lord is going to answer my prayers tomorrow. I too just want to say tonight, I'm just so thankful that the Lord does answer prayers. And not just once in a while either. It was real thrilling to hear Sister Jill's talk tonight because we were praying for that man too. And that's just one of the little things. But I've been so impressed lately. You know, Jesus said, if your faith is a mustard seed. And I'll think, oh, Lord, if I had some more faith, just think what you could do. And so I'm just praying that the Lord will give me more faith, that we can really believe what he said. Sister, you know how you get more, don't you? Ask for more. Yes, (laughs) Yes, but use what you have. Amen. (laughs) Faith is like muscle. It grows as you use it. Uh, I'm category one. I'm so thankful that the Lord answers our prayers and that he loves us. And I'm especially thankful because I know it's a thrill to the angels sometimes when Jesus and the angels arrange to answer my prayers while I'm still thinking about praying them. And this has happened to me many times when I be thinking, here's a problem. And I know Jesus wants to do something about this, but I don't know what he wants to do. So I'm going to pray about it. And before I get around to praying about it, he's already answered it. But, of course, he said he would. Thank you. Glad to see you, Homer. Day before yesterday, I arrived here again from San Jose, Costa Rica. On an extended trip down through Central America, we visited nine of God's programs that are being carried on throughout Central America. It was a joy to me. In almost every program, I had conversations with different ones who are truly seeking God's way, who are desiring to get back to the pattern in one way or another. This gave me courage to believe that the Lord could help in the project that I'm carrying on. On our way down, we visited it and uh, came to the conclusion that the Lord wanted us to have more farmland After looking around quite extensively, we saw many doors closed, and all of a sudden we saw a door open wide. My brother-in-law had been wanting to sell his property at a very reasonable price for some time, but uh, couldn't find a buyer, so the Lord opened that door. But, as you can well imagine, that leaves many problems that are unsolved yet. Richard Scott needs to get moved down. 
We need uh, money for planting crops, equipment. And so you can imagine that I've been in prayer since I had nothing else to do while I was riding all that way. Uh, we had a few other problems, too, to bring my mind to prayer. But apparently I'm in the second category. And uh, I imagine some other folks here who are interested in our project are also in that category in that matter. And so I ask an interest in your prayers as we continue to pray that the Lord will impress hearts, that he will also change hearts because there are probably hearts that need to be changed and more completely dedicated to him as he opens doors so that work can expand in our area of the world. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. It's so interesting how we grow in the Christian life. I can well remember when I first became a Seventh-day Adventist, I prayed sort of on an emergency room basis. Uh, Whenever I had a problem, I would pray, but I didn't know too much about the in-between times. And I don't remember exactly when I began to find out that I didn't have to do all the speaking. I used to think it was kind of cheating if I didn't do all the praying all at once, and if I read a little poem or something, that was somebody else's. That wasn't my prayer. But I have found that opening the Bible and reading the promises of God and meditating upon the promises that I have read have enriched my prayer life very much. It makes a little bit longer, but that way God and I are communicating together. Cool. And this is one of the most precious things that I have learned about praying is that it's not just a one-way street from me to God. It goes both ways. Thank you. I feel comfortable praying about asking the Lord for a new heart or a new spirit, but I, I feel like sometimes he doesn't re it's a waste of time to pray for little things, but the Lord reminded me that he does care about little things. Recently, I have this spider plant in my room, and it's, I've had it for two years, and it's been growing very well, putting out lots of new leaves, but no little shoots, no little new baby spider plant. And I did everything I could to try and make it, make a new shoot. I watered it faithfully. I repotted it. I did all these things. And I couldn't figure out why it's just not having a new shoot. So after two years, I thought, well, I'm going to pray about this. I thought it's really silly. But I knelt down. I said, Lord, this is a minor thing. But if you want, you know, could you help this plant have a new shoot? And and I I made it like you don't have to do it, but if it was your will, you know. And so I thought, well, this is ridiculous. Nothing's going to happen. And in a matter of days, that plant got two new shoots. And on each shoot, there's not one, but there's a whole bunch of beautiful little blossoms. And when we went up to Michigan, it got really cold in our room, and the leaves on the side door of the window froze but those new little shoots look better than ever, and so the Lord does care about little things. I was reading about promises this week and trusting in the Lord. There's a lot of people that believe that if you claim enough promises and believe hard enough that your prayers will be answered, and all you have to do is just claim the promise, but I was reading in one of these books by Elder Vinden, what happened to Hus and Jerome? They had all kinds of promises they could claim, and they still, they still uh, were burned. Well, the idea was to trust God with your life, even if it means doing something that you wouldn't choose, like being burned. So I'm thankful that the Lord has taken the burden of trying for me to plan my life and to just trust him because he loves me so much and wants the best for me. And I just praise him for that revelation tonight. Well, you're getting through the second grade and you'll be ready for the third. I'm sure there are some folks here tonight who feel they don't know how to pray and get answers like this. And that's the reason I want to say we're, uh, I didn't know how to pray, didn't know anything about praying. But I wanted to be a Christian, and I got on my knee, and I said, Lord, make me a Christian. That's all I said. And I'm here tonight. 
Another time, shortly after that, I wanted to quit smoking. I couldn't, and I got him a neat, and I says, Lord, I can't do it. You'll have to do it for me. I was smoking almost three packs a day. I got up, never touched a cigarette from that time until this day. But there's something I regret, folks, and I, and I want to bring it to your attention. Don't get in the same position. You know what I regret? As I look back the times that I neglected to pray. Whenever you have a need, don't neglect to pray. Call on the Lord and you answer. Let's see our text again. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Thank you. Is there anybody here tonight that's never given your heart to Jesus? And you will tonight, and you want our prayers, will you stand? Is there somebody here tonight that once gave your heart to Jesus, but you took it back? You've been walking without him? Tonight you want to give your heart back to him? Will you stand? Just remain standing a moment, brother. There's somebody else. There's, yes, Lord. You, God bless you, sister. Just remain standing a moment. Somebody else that says, God's calling me. I'm making a full surrender tonight. Is there somebody here tonight that says, I've got a problem, a special problem that God knows all about, and tonight I'm determining, by God's help, to press in, in prayer, to let Jesus solve that problem. Would you raise your hand? Shall we kneel together? Our Father, bless these who tonight have stood in a decision to put their hands in the hand of Jesus. Take them, Lord, very close to thy dear heart and make them know how glad heaven is for their return. Fill them with thy good spirit. And then, Lord, you've seen these scores of hands of those who have a problem. What heart is there here tonight that doesn't have some kind of problem, Lord? We're bringing them to thee individually, specifically just now. And we pray for we know that our prayers are heard through Jesus' name. We pray that thou will take each desire as though that one were the only one coming from this planet tonight. And we believe that our prayer is heard because Christ has died, risen, ascended, and intercedes for us. And we thank thee for the answer in his name. Amen. God from whom all blessings flow, praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son.